I'm picking in Second Peter. Actually, what I plan to do is to go through the book of. I want to start with us a special kind of study, and I'm picking in Second Peter. Actually, what I plan to do is to go through the book of Second Peter with us, but I will not do it uh, the way we normally do expository study. That is. I go from verse to verse, from sentence to sentence, from phrase to phrase. I will not have time to do that, because if I do that, we cannot finish a chapter in a day. And yet, I don't know how much time we have. We have three chapters, so I want to see if we can just take one Monday, and we take one chapter, and then on. But as we go on, you will see the reason why I picked this book. And the various areas that I believe is relevant to us at this time in our church life, I'll be bringing them out uh, and I will delve extensively on those areas and then we pass on. The other parts I will just gloss over there. Uh, you will understand why we are doing it like that because, as I said, we don't have too much time. Now, in Second Peter, now this epistle, Second Peter, was written by the Apostle Peter. And it fits our present circumstance. My goal in selecting this book is not to conduct a full exposition of the book. Rather, I shall use it as a launching pad for my most pressing thoughts. These thoughts, they are a summary of all that we have taught while among you. Like Peter, all that remains for me now is to call you to remembrance. Of all that we have taught and stood for. The word remembrance occurs four times in this epistle. Actually, it appears about uh, 60 something times all through the Bible. The word remember, remembering, remembrance, and so on. All the varieties of that word. But you will see that in these uh, three short, short chapters of First Second Peter, that word remembrance occurs four times and it gives us a clue to the goal the purpose in the mind of the apostle peter in writing the book in second peter chapter 1 verse 12 wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though ye know them and be established in the present truth see Peter said, <laughs> I will, I will not, it will be negligence on my part if I don't put you in remembrance of all these things that I'm going to, that I'm telling you in this episode. He said, one, I know you know those things. And my brothers and sisters, as the things I'll be telling you this uh, time that we are permitted together, there will be things that you know. The things that we have said over and over again over the years. The things that we have shared and we have emphasized in preaching, in teaching, in lifestyle, in example, in question and answer, in personal, private counseling, those same things. Although you know them, but it will still be negligence on our part if we don't still remind you of them. Not only that. Peter said, you are established in the present truth. You know, many times... The problem with church nowadays is that people want to hear new doctrine. And we preachers, we are under pressure, uh, you know, to say something new, which is, and is, uh, something new may not always be something coming from God. Because no one that has uh, tasted the new old wine desires the new, because he says the old is better. But you know, many times we like to hear new things. You come to church and they say, the message today is on uh, restitution. Or the message today is on uh, the challenge of soul winning. Or the message today is on uh, follow peace with all men and holiness. Or the message today is on uh, uh, love not the world. Sometimes if you are not careful, you will feel, when are we going to hear something new? When are we going to hear something fresh? That was the attitude the Israelites had with manna after some time. They said there is nothing before our eyes except this manna. They said it in a contemptuous way. And we should be very careful so we don't get to that point. Not only that, sometimes you know we are established in some truths. 
It is evident that we know it. It is even being manifested in our lives. And yet, it may please the Lord sometimes that He still brings that same truth that we have known, that we have established in, that we are practicing, that we are demonstrating. Even now, He still tells us. I will show you examples. Because, you know, Paul said, although you know these things, I still want to remind you. I still want to tell you. Look at Jesus Christ. There were things he told his disciples at the beginning. Go and preach the gospel. He sent them two by two. And uh, they went. They came back. He sent them 70 again. They went. They came back. He, when he still finished, he still said at the end, Now, you are witnesses of these things. Repentance and remission of sin must be preached. Go and preach it. Go into all the world. And then when he came back, that was, you know, after his death, he still said it again. It informs, it informs you then that although we may know some truths, we shouldn't think, Pastor, you are insulting us by teaching this one. We know these things. You're talking about restitution? You're talking about marriage, one man, one wife? You're talking about the danger of compromise? You're talking about the danger of false prophets? You're talking about the problem of backsliding? You're talking about holiness and sanctification as a second work of grace? You feel we don't need to worry about ourselves about the, and those of us who are pastors? Be careful. There are temptations that we have sometimes. And the devil will tell you, if you preach this point message, your people will think that you don't have the Spirit of God again. They will think that you don't have new message. Therefore, this one, don't preach it. Look for something they have never heard about. Look for a verse of scripture they have never known. And bring it to them so that they will know that you are still reading the Bible. It's not the new verse that matters. It is the Spirit of God breathing upon the whole spirit. Uh, message. And that's what brings life to the people. So Peter said, although you know it, I'll still remind you. That's why as we are, you know, rind, rind, winding up and rounding up, we need to see remind ourselves again. Not only that. In verse 13, he says, Yea, I think, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in what? Remembrance. He said, I, I think that as long as I'm still alive, I have this duty of reminding you again and that the only time I will stop telling you about these doctrines of the Word of God is when I'm no longer alive. As long as I'm in this tabernacle, I remind you again. Then in verse 14 it says, I know that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. That means he was going to die even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. And now since you know you are going to die, can't you talk about another thing? Can't you say something new? Can't you tell us something we have never heard? Can't you tell us something that will really sh- surprise us, that will say, this is new? He said, no, verse, f- verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my disease, that means after I have died, to have these things always in remembrance. Three verses, and in each of those verses, remembrance, remembrance, remembrance. That's why I chose Peter, Second Peter. So that you will know, the Lord wants us to remind ourselves again of those truths that have been freely and surely believed among us over the years and practiced. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Peter said, I know your minds are pure. I know you are pure in heart. You are holy. I know you are practicing and you are preaching holiness and you are pure in mind, but holy people can forget. And when holy people forget, it is a matter of time before they become unholy. And so before they forget, remind them again. You know, my brothers and sisters, Peter considered it necessary to put these believers in remembrance because he knew, he knew very, very well human nature. Pastors, if you are going to be a successful pastor, you must understand human nature. Some of you maybe have been asking, what materials does pastor use? What materials does pastor have? I say it in all humility, that one of the materials I have, apart from Bible, apart from concordance, which I've opened up to you, and I'll see open it up, if you are permit me, I'll bring all those materials again, display them, so that, and the ones I've even got, after the other display we did the other time, I'll bring everything, so that you'll see, that you see there's nothing, diff- nothing special there. But one material that every pastor needs to be successful is the understanding of human nature. And Peter understood human nature very, very well. What did he understand? He understood that it is part of human nature that generally humans forget what they should remember and they remember what they should forget. And Peter knew that. 
Therefore, he reminded them, he reminded them constantly, not only that, not only that. Peter himself, he had learned this bitter truth of human nature. This bitter truth that you can forget what you should remember, you remember what you should Peter could tell by experience. Look at Matthew 25, 26. Matthew 26 and verse 75. Matthew 26, verse, the last verse. Or maybe verse uh, 74, first of all. No, it's okay, the last verse. Matthew 26, 75. And Peter, what? You have not found it? I want your response because I want to enjoy this teaching very, very well. Uh, because, you know, it's like the last meal. And Peter, what? Remembered the words of Jesus. He remembered, but he remembered too late. What did he remember? What Jesus said that before the cock crowd, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept bitterly. That's why he, he, he said, look, I have gone through it all before. I know the pain of forgetting what you should remember. What did he forget? Jesus told him, look here, you are going to deny me. Hey, he said, before the cock crowd of you are going to deny me, he said, throw it off. Me? I don't know about Bartholomew. I don't know about Thomas. I don't know about all these other junior you know, apostles. Me? After going through the Mount of Transfiguration and seeing Moses, Elijah, and Jesus Christ, and after hearing those voices, and after all those wonderful, wonderful things that my eyes have seen, after being with you when you are raising up Jairus' daughter, and just saying, Talita Kumi, and a woman, a girl rises up, me, deny you, after, deny what? After all those things, I was there. When you, a, a, a dead child, the widow of Naim, and you raise up the child, deny you, uh -uh. forget it. Have you forgotten? When you said, the other time, you know, uh, the other people went back and you said, will you also go away? Who answered the question? Me? That I said, to whom shall we go? That has the words of eternal life. And after all that, and I've even gone out and cast out devils in your name. And I was there in all those, uh, those people who were welcoming Hosanna, blessed is the son of David. You think after seeing all that, I'll be stupid enough to deny you, not me. Uh, Jesus said, the things I'm saying are not idle words. But he said, no, don't say it again. And then they close the chapter. There are some things the Lord tells us, and we say, no. Others can, others can deny you. Others can do that. Others can go that way. Me, oh. But when we are saying that, we are not saying that in trembling. We are not saying that prayerfully. We are not saying that on our knees. We are not saying that... I wrote a letter to the pastor yesterday. I will send it tomorrow. And I said, pastor, I said, you know, all that I've been told, I said, I know, I know it's the will of God. I said, but pastor, uh, there are some things that I never forget in my life. That I'm still wondering... That pastor, you didn't know me. You only heard there was somebody called so and so. And that we never met except once when I brought a letter to you from the pastor at Ibadan. I said, pastor, just on the basis of somebody said there was somebody somewhere. You risked the whole of Ife Church and put it in my hand. You never knew me. You didn't know my life, whether I was a hypocrite or anything. You just committed everything to my hand like that. And I know you don't do like that normally. You took a risk. I said, but what that risk made me to do was to make up my mind that, God, I will be loyal to Christ, I will be loyal to God, I will be loyal to the Bible, then I will be loyal to my pastor. I said, pastor, that has been my decision. I said, but I know there are people who have said that, even more serious things than that, but they eventually ate their words. We know they, they are still around. I said, but pastor, pray for me. That if you can pray for me, I will hold on till the end. Then I quoted a song, that song that our choir used to sing. And that song says, Lord, help me to stand when the last man <laughs> falls. <laughs> Until that day when the trumpet will sound, he God will help me to stand. I will stand. And so I said, Pastor, pray for me. That if you pray for me, I will stand. If you are saying like Peter is saying, you are not saying it in trembling. You are not saying it in tears. You are saying it like a confident person. Anybody can backslide. Not me. Never. My friend, there's a devil somewhere. 
Peter forgot. Jesus warned him, but he forgot. And you know, that forgetfulness cost him a serious problem. But for the mercy of God, that man would have been cut off from Christ forever. I told you, Jesus took him through a threefold confession to break the curse that he had put upon himself. You are one of them, he said, never, I don't know him. You are one of them, he said, no, not me. You are one of them, he said, never. He cursed and he abused himself. And then, after he said that, Jesus looked at him. No message, no preaching. He just looked at his face and Peter understood. And then he went. But the deed had been done already. That was why Peter reminded the people. He said, let me remind you. So that you people will not think, well, we know it. We can never do it. It can never happen to us. Some others have said it before. There's nothing anybody can say today. Some people have said it before. They didn't stand. They are still alive. All they preached. All they stood for. All they emphasized. They are eating their words. They are biting the finger that fed them. They are saying things that you will be surprised. I pray God will help you to stand. That's why Peter wrote. And uh, so go to Second Peter, chapter one, and in verse one, it says Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There we find the introduction. And that's also point one. Special greeting from the apostle to believers. Special greeting from the apostle to, the, to believers. Point, that would be verses one to four. Point two. Spiritual growth. As antidote antidote means prevention spiritual growth as antidote against backsliding spiritual growth as antidote against backsliding point number that will be verses 5 to 11 point number 3 solid ground for our abiding boldness solid ground for our abiding boldness. Now in point one you find the writer, Simon Peter. He called himself a servant. Uh, my brothers and sisters, think about it. You have preached on the day of Pentecost. You have done great exploits. People have been saved. 3,000 in a day. At another time, 5,000. And then people have received Holy Ghost. You have opened the door of gospel to the Gentiles. You have even raised the dead, Tabitha or Dorcas. And after you have done all that, then you are writing. And the first thing you are saying about yourself is servant. That's humility. And that's one thing that God will want us to manifest always in our lives. Humility. Whatever the Lord makes us to become in the church or in the world, Humility. Wherever God takes us to, whichever point He leads us to, humility. You know, there's evidence of your growth. It's not the more knowledge of the Bible you have. It's not the more gift you have. The first evidence of your growth is your growth in humility. If you are not growing in humility, you are not growing spiritually. The only evidence that you can have Greatest evidence above gift, talent, ability, anything that you are growing in the Lord is that you are becoming more like Christ. And how like Christ are you becoming? I am meek and lowly where? In heart. The evidence of spiritual growth is humility. And so Peter, as he grew in the Lord, he grew in humility. Back up to chapter 5, just a chapter before Second Peter. Chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, whom am also what? An elder. He didn't say, he didn't even call himself an apostle. He said, I'm an elder. Just one of the elders. Not the only elder, 
not the chief elder, not the first class elder, but one of the elders. What a lesson the Lord is telling us about humility. And uh, we find that in the life of Peter over and over again. But then, because of time, let's go forward. You look at the recipients of the letter. And this where this greeting is special. This is why I said it's a special greeting from the apostle to believers. In verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Oh, he says, you people, you have obtained the same faith, precious faith, that we have. You have learned it. You have tasted it. You have experienced it. You have possessed it. Precious faith. That's the same thing Paul called in Jude verse 3, sorry, that Jude called the common salvation that we should honestly contain for the faith. Peter qualifies it here. He says it's a precious faith, brothers and sisters. What God has given us in deeper life is a precious faith. If you have obtained it, you have tasted it, I can tell you, I've, I've been privileged to watch Deeper Life before coming in for years. I've seen this church as an outsider. Now, thank God, I've seen it as an insider. I'm better than some of you who are converted into Deeper Life and you are converted in Deeper Life. From day one of your conversion, you have been in Deeper Life. You don't know outside. I have known outside and I know all the other things that happen outside i mean i've observed this church as an outsider and i'm insider now and it's a precious faith honestly contend for that faith don't toy with that faith don't play with that faith don't allow anything to touch that faith we can apologize for any other thing but we cannot and we will not apologize for this precious faith the faith must be preserved. I give thanks to God. In all my years among you, I only remember one occasion, 1992 or 93, when I was told of somebody that uh, had the message that I preached. I preached against something that was wrong, and they told me that person was, uh, you know, asking questions or saying why is this and why is that. And the next opportunity I had, I went back to the pulpit and I, I told that individual, that nobody has any right to censor the message that I preach here. Word of God. If it is the Bible, scriptures, that are eternal forever, is higher than the preacher itself. And nobody can accept it is error or bad false doctrine. But if I stand on this solid ground of the scriptures of the word of God, I will not allow a single moment, one minute of anybody arguing or contending against the world. If he cannot take the word, I will allow him to leave the church. And I thank God years have come and gone. You prayed for the pastor, and the pastor did not deviate. I didn't come here and tell you, well, that one is Lagos. Here is another thing. I tell you everything, and when I say it, you hear it in the pulpit. Sometimes you hear it on cassettes. Sometimes you hear it when we go for retreats outside here. So, whenever I say it, it's open there for everybody to hear and to see. And then you can test it with the Holy Ghost inside you. Is this the Word of God or is this not the Word of God? And then you can come back and say, yes, this is the Word of God. And that's the same attitude we should have anytime and everywhere. The faith is precious. And whoever is uh, going to lead us, whatever he says, if it is the Word of God, we bow our heads before the Word of God. The Word of God is higher than its preacher. Electricity is higher than the manufacturer of it. If the manufacturer of electricity plays with it, it will kill him. And so, the Word of God is like sword. It can cut anybody, including the one preaching it. And we thank God because we don't mince the Word here. If the Word smites us, we submit and surrender to the Word of God. We don't argue and contend and say, why should it be, why should it not be? We contend for the faith. And Paul says, and Jude says, a precious faith. So, the faith God has given us in this church is precious. But before I leave that, let me also say that uh, I can also say of you all here that you have been partaker with me by the grace of God of the like precious faith. In Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verse 10. 
For thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. And then he went on in verse 11. Here was Paul talking to Timothy. He said, Timothy, you know everything about my life. And I think all of you here, you know everything. Most of you, maybe not all, but uh, I think most of you, majority of you know my life. After all, we have gone in and out all these years. You know what we stand for. Thou hast fully know my doctrine. You know the doctrine, you know my emphasis over the years. The emphasis in the word of God. You know everything. You know my doctrine. You know my doctrinal bent. You know the, 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 the tenor of the messages and the preaching and the life and everything. You know the manner of life also. You know our manner of life. You know the purpose. You know the faith. You know the long suffering, though I'm not rich in that yet. You know the charity, I'm not rich in that yet. You know the patience, I still need a lot of that yet. But if I have any little of all those things, you know it. So I can say that you're also a partaker with us of like precious faith. And that's why there is a special bonding by the grace of God that I have. And uh, with all of us here, yeah, and with the church in this place. And because of that bonding, I know that uh, a lot of, you know, we're going to miss one another. And uh, yet, it's just the cause. The Lord says so. And yet, we know that what we have got is a like, precious faith. Therefore, let us hold on that like, precious faith. Don't let us play with it. And you pray for me. That anywhere I go. If you hear anything at all, Church may grow, it may not grow. I may have the privilege of building a large church in that place. I may not have the privilege. I may just labor, 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 and maybe after 10 years, 20 people. It may be. But whatever the case, you just pray for me that those 20 people, they will be like you. If they are like you, it's okay. If they are serious with God, heaven-minded, committed, consecrated, holy, ready for the trumpet sound. Only 20. That will be okay. And you pray for me that you will never hear that that man changed the word of God. For any reason, for any reason, if you pray, God will answer your prayer. You know, last Saturday we learned about praying for leaders. And uh, you pray. And the way you are praying for the GS that he has been holding on all the pressure and everything, it didn't change. If you pray to God, we answer. And there will be no change. And you still see us 10 years, and you still find that it's still the same thing, standing on the word of God that cannot fail. It's a like, precious faith. If you lose any other thing, if you don't have money, you have no house, you have no job, you have nothing, I plead with you. This like, precious faith, Hold it fast. It's a very great thing that you have in your hand. And if you, if I hear that any of you drops this like precious faith, I'll cry and I'll know that it's because you dropped the like precious faith. That's why you backslid. And I'm praying. It will not happen to any of us. Like precious faith. When something is precious, you guard it jealously. When something is precious, you keep it seriously, perfectly. Those who have precious things in the world, they put it in their banks, in their safe. They lock it up. They don't allow it to mess up on the ground. They lock it where nobody can get there. And the more precious that thing is, the more the strong room where they will put it, the stronger it will be. What you have, brothers and sisters, is more than dollars. What you have is more than money. What you have is more than anything on earth. What you have in this church, and especially what you have had, these years we have been together, brothers and sisters, is more than anything. A brother phoned me last night. Was it? Or two nights ago. Two nights ago. That was Saturday night. Uh, Saturday night yes saturday night that's after the meeting and everything and he said 
I'm so and so. He mentioned his name. I said, uh, then eventually I remember. He said, Pastor, that uh, he just wanted to uh, discuss with me that, you know, uh, he had opportunities here and there. And all. he's a young brother. He, he was here and then he has, he's in Lagos now. Then he said a lot of things. He said, you know, there are opportunities for him that to go to America and all that, but that he, didn't, he doesn't want to go to that place by legal means. He doesn't want to go and sell his conscience. He doesn't want to go and do anything on, on, on righteous. He doesn't want to go and. He, he, I, I, he, he didn't know what he was saying. Was, was, my heart was just jumping. Then after I said that, he said, Pastor, you know, that uh, since I gave my life to Christ in 1995, I didn't know that he gave his life to Christ. I didn't know when he gave his life to Christ. That he went to Liberia, and he said when you came back, you preached a particular message on family or something. That, that was when I got born again. And that since that time, I made up my mind, nothing, I'm not going to change. That I'm going to stand. And that I'm going to... God was just using that to really, you know, make me glad. That, you know, uh, he was not ready to play any prank that there are people who could help, but he was not going to do all that. When he finished, then I said, oh, brother, God bless you. I said, let me pray for you. I prayed for him. Then he said, excuse me, sir, before you drop, I want to pray for you too. So I said, uh, my, he said is that okay? I said, my eyes are closed already, and I'll close my eyes by that time for prayer. <laughs> and then he began to pray. He said, Lord, uh, we hear a lot of things about people. About, you know, all the kinds of... He's in Lagos, so he hears a lot. He said, but, oh God, help my father in the Lord that nothing will happen to him, that he will not change, that this will not happen. And I said a hearty amen. He said yeah, that he likes to come and do retreats here, that the atmosphere in Ifa is different from this and that. You know the way a young convert will talk. That he's been looking for the cases, that he went to a brother so and so, he thought we'd just get the cases easily. I said, you know, this is not Lagos, the cases are not just there to buy at anyhow. He, and then he, he, he said all that. He had tasted of the like precious faith. You have tasted it too. Don't change it. And by the grace of God, I will not change it. So, that's the special greeting from the apostle to believers. Point number two, spiritual growth as antidote against backsliding. I told you the meaning of antidote means prevention. It's because of alliteration, that's why I'm using that word, antidote. Spiritual growth as antidote against backsliding. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you, and they are bound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, those things from verses 5 to 7, he that lacketh them is blind, spiritually. And he cannot see a power, and he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the apostle is telling us here that the secret of not backsliding, the prevention, the thing that can prove, stop you from going back is to go forward not to stand still. What Peter is telling us is that if you don't want to go back, the secret is keep going forward. That the moment you stop and you are not going forward again, the next thing to do is to go back. There's no middle line between the two. And my brothers and sisters, register it in your mind. You don't want to backslide? Keep going forward. Going forward in what? He gives us seven steps you should keep climbing here. And he, he, he say, it's like a step. You go from one level to another, from one level to another. And he says that if you are climbing those steps, then you will not be buried spiritually. You will not be unfruitful in your knowledge of Jesus. But if you don't climb those steps, he says, you are blind. You cannot see a fire up. You are forgotten that you are forgiven of your sin and you are going to go back. And your election and your calling will not be sure. In other words, you will fall. Verse 11, verse 10. The last part of verse 10. If ye do these things, ye shall what? 
never fall. You know that psalm? Blessed is the man whose right to unrighteousness is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin, and in whose spirit there is no guile. For while I held my tongue, my bones consumed their way through my day, roaring all the day long. For thy hand was upon me, and my moisture was like, uh, my bones was like moisture in summer. And after he said all that, he said, Whoso doeth these things shall never fall. That's in Psalm 15 also. He said it. He that doeth these things, he said, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, who shall stand in the holy place, and I see that, uh, you know, uh, clean hearts and pure hands, he does, in whose size a vile person is contained. And after mentioning all those things, he said, he that doeth those things shall never fall. This is the New Testament equivalent of Psalm 15. Before I go on with this New Testament equivalent, let's look at that Psalm 15 also itself. Psalm 15, in verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And who shall stand or dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. I want you to notice that those three things, they are in the continuous sense. He walketh, that means he has been walking, he keeps on walking. Not that you are walking before, then you backslide. Then it says, he walketh, that means he walked it, and he's still walking it till now. Righteousness, in a continuous manner. He speaketh, he spoke it, he is speaking it, he continues to speak the truth in his heart. He backbacketh not with his tongue. He does not do evil to his neighbor. He does not take reproach against his neighbor. He, in new size, a vile person is contained, but he honors continually. Then that fear the Lord, he, he that swears to his own heart, he makes his own vow and consecration, and he does not change it. He does not put his money to injury. He does not take reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never what? Be moved. The same thing as saying shall never fall. Now, the second Peter 1 now says, if you do these things, you shall never fall. What are you supposed to do that will keep you from falling? If you backslide, it is because you have stopped doing these things that we are going to look at together briefly. If you go back, it is because you have stopped doing these things. But if you keep on doing these things, you will never fall. A thousand may fall on your right hand side. Ten thousand may fall on your left hand side. You will not fall. Say amen. amen. But the secret is keep doing these things that we are going to look at. If you are doing them, you will not fall. Do you know that if somebody wants to fall... Uh, if you're on bicycle, for example, as long as the bicycle is moving, you keep your two feet on the pedal, you know you will not fall uh, because the bicycle is going on. But if you stop the bicycle and your two legs are still on the pedal, what happens? You fall because you stopped. That is how it is with the Christian life. As long as you are still winding that pedal, doing that pedaling, you are going forward. You can't fall. But the moment you stop, you fall. Look at the aeroplane, the jet system of aeroplane. There are aeroplanes that use propeller, old, old ones. The modern ones now, they use jets. And the law behind that jet, the mechanism behind it is that as long as that aeroplane is pushing forward and something is, uh, is uh, thrusting back, this, the, the force with which it's pushing back is making it to go forward. As long as that airplane is going forward, it cannot fall. But if an airplane gets into the air, and shuts down the engine, it will collapse. It will fall. And your Christian life is like that. If you shut down, you will fall. Therefore, keep on. Don't shut down. Keep on. Keep on. Keep on. That is why aeroplane is not like motor car that your fuel is about to finish, your branch in the uh, next uh, petrol station and buy fuel. If fuel finishes in aeroplane, that's the end of the people inside it. That is why they know where the fuel will get to and they don't play with it. They don't manage it. Your spiritual life is like an aeroplane. Fuel must not finish. If fuel finishes inside it, huh, you get lost. Spiritual growth itself is an antidote. Apart from giving you opportunity to serve, you know when you are growing in the Lord, you, if you are a small uh, do a little work before, then you have a bigger work. Then as you grow, then you have a bigger responsibility. Then as you grow, you have a higher responsibility. Apart from that privilege that you get, because you are growing, also, it keeps you from backsliding. And what is that growth? Look at the steps. Verse 5. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Let's start from that. Faith is the foundation. Faith is the foundation. One, we are saved. 
by grace. That's Ephesians chapter 2, by, verse uh, 8. And then we are kept and preserved by faith. And we continue the Christian journey by faith. Now, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews chapter 10, I think verse 38. But if any man look back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So, faith is the foundation. But upon the, that basis of saving faith, upon that foundation of faith is saving faith, the next thing you are going to build on it is virtue. Build virtue. My brothers and sisters, build virtue into your spiritual life. I don't have time to go through the meaning of each of these words because, you know, I want to finish tonight. Virtue. Build virtue. It means strength, courage, which enables you to stand up for good things. Virtue. That makes you to be good, practice good, and be bold, courageous, to stand up for truth. Many daughters have done virtuously. But thou excellest them all. You are a virtuous man, virtuous woman. You stand, you know what is good. You are practicing it and you are promoting it also. Virtue. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Sorry, verse, yes, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You see the family virtue belongs into, it belongs in the family of whatever things are true. It belongs in the same family as whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, pure, lovely, good report, then virtue. So, when it says, add to your faith virtue, it means... Add to this, add to your faith, this kind of life that is not just having faith and faith alone, but it is faith and righteousness, faith and holiness. Let it be that virtue is in your life. You know, the, the problem of the charismatic circles today is that they talk about faith without virtue. The problem with many of the Pentecostal assemblies, most of these churches springing up around us today, is that they have an emphasis on faith, and that's okay. But the problem is, they are emphasizing faith to the exclusion of Christian virtue. I don't know all things. So don't say, ah, pastor knows all things. If you say that, you'll be saying something that is not true. There are many things I don't know. Many, many things. And that others will still teach you. That I don't know them. But maybe others will teach you. So add knowledge to your virtue. Keep learning. Don't get to a point in your life, they are preaching, and you close your Bible, and you are looking at the preacher like this. I've never got to that point in my life. By the grace of God, I'm still adding knowledge. That's how to grow. Add knowledge. When, when you get to that point, that now you close the Bible and you are looking like this, backsliding has become. They call the person, you don't even look at it. They call the person, you don't even do anything. I just say, well, I know it. My brother, my sister, that is evidence of backsliding. And so, add to your virtue knowledge. Then, add to knowledge temperance. Temperance, that means self-control. Moderacy in everything. If you are growing in the Lord, true, true. One evidence that you are growing in Christ is that you will be growing in your self-control, self-discipline. If you see 126, if any man among you seem to be religious, and bride let not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. That passage is telling us, if you say you are growing, you are more religious now, you are deeper now, but you are not growing in temperance, the control of your tongue, the use of your mouth, then you are not growing. Show me that you are growing, brothers and sisters, by becoming more grave. Let's talk at it. Partaking gossip is not evidence of growth. You are more self-controlled. You talk, but you are not talkative. You are, you, you are not a jester. You are not cracking joke here and there. And you are not a clown. And you are not somebody that will just be saying foolish, foolish things so that people can laugh. You are disciplined. You are sober. Though you are not bitter. You are not sour. You are sober. 
and you are self control, you are showing that I'm growing because you know the high, deep waters are quiet. So, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. So, grow in your self control, not only of your tongue, even in things that you do, temperance in using the good things of life. The good things of life. We should show temperance in how we use the food. As a leader, you will not be eating and eating and eating until you become in, you enjoy yourself. Drink. You will not be drinking and drinking. You deny yourself some things. Sleep. You don't sleep and sleep until, you know, you cannot even do quiet time again. Clothes. You don't make clothes your God to the point that you are just buying clothes, buying clothes, buying clothes, even though you don't need it. You see it on someone, you also buy it. You see it on somebody, you must buy it. You see it on this other person, you must buy it. Or shoe. And you are all the time looking for new, new things. Mutoka. You know, you have this car now. And then as you see this one, you say, oh, this is another better car. I will sell this one and buy that better car. And there is nothing wrong with this one. Temperance. And then, in all the things that we do, Add to your knowledge temperance. If you have knowledge, but you don't have self-control, it's an unfortunate condition because that knowledge will kill that man. Look at a young child, a teenage boy, 16 years of age. The father rich. And this boy, has, by the age of 16, known how to drive. He has learned it. He has the knowledge of driving. But, brothers and sisters, that boy does not have self-control. So when he gets at the wheel, he just handles the steering and drives anyhow. Trailer is coming. Anything is coming. He doesn't care. Passengers, pedestrians are passing. He doesn't have the self-control to discipline himself. Uh, one drunkard is coming by the way. And this young boy will not think two mad people should not meet together. This man is mad. Why should I also behave mad? And wait for the madman to pass. He also says, okay, you want to do it? I do my own. Then they knock themselves. Then the boy dies. He has knowledge, but no self-control. Knowledge destroys when we don't have self-discipline. Knowledge puffed up. If you have knowledge without self-discipline, you will be puffed up. You will become so proud that, you know, you cannot say, uh, you will be bigger than yourself. And that will not be helpful for your spiritual life. And that can eventually lead you to backsliding. Knowledge. When somebody wants to correct you, you will not agree. Don't be like that. These are things that can keep us from backsliding. Temperance. Then he says, to temperance, add patience. Patience. This is a grace that is fast fading in Christendom today. The grace of patience. The ability to wait. Number one, to wait for God. If you don't have the gift of faith, I told you before, one of the gifts God has blessed me with is the gift of patience. Ability to wait. Be patient. Be patient for God. Oh God, why is it that this one has not happened, that one has not happened, this one has not happened? Wait. Oh God, why is it that you have not got me to this place in my secular life or in my spiritual life? Why is it, oh God? You know, there are people, they cannot be patient. I should have been this, church has not made me that. I should have been that, church has not made me that. I should have been in this position, church has not put me there. Be patient. Wait for God. Patience pays. God cannot forget anyone. I should have been in this level now, but I don't know why. It's like they have forgotten me. Wait. Be patient. Patient, wait for God. Number two, wait on God. In prayer, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Wait upon the Lord in prayer. And when you are praying, be patient. I have prayed for this thing. God has not done it. I don't know what God is looking at. Maybe I will go and look for another way out of this problem. Wait, be patient. My brothers, I am number one to tell you. Patient space. It pays a lot. And Psalm 27, verse 14 says... Wait on the Lord, and I shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Wait. Don't run. Don't rush. There are people that say, I have this vision, I have this vision, and deeper life is not having that vision now. They are not doing that now, and they run ahead. Be patient. There are things the church is doing now. Some people, 10 years ago, they wanted it to be done at that time. And the church said, we are not yet led. But they could not wait. We have to do it quickly. We have to do it quickly. They have to do it quickly. Wait. Be patient. 
There is time for God. God has his timetable. And for every one of our lives, God has his timetable. For your life, for my life. Let's wait for, wait for your time. Don't run ahead of God. Don't rush ahead of God. You may break your leg. Wait on the law. Be patient. Add to your temperance, patience. Then, add to patience, godliness. Godliness means God-likeness. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and what? Godliness. That's part of our call. Our call is to be like God. My brothers and sisters, never stop until you keep on struggling, keep on pursuing to be like God. Sometimes we pray. We say, oh God, make me like so and so. Make me like so and so. Okay, but please, why don't you pray? Lord, make me like you. Please make me like you. Do what you must do, Lord, to make me like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. In all you must do, Lord, just make me like you. You say, God, to be like God is better. We may appreciate a man. We may appreciate a leader. We may appreciate a person. Say, I want to be like that person. I want to be like that person. Okay, but it's better you be like God. Add to your God, uh, patience, godliness. And then number six, add to godliness, brotherly kindness. My brothers and sisters, the way God has helped us to work together these years, they are wonderful. Has it not been wonderful? I said, has it not been wonderful? Therefore, let us continue in brotherly kindness, loving one another. Don't let there be anything among us that will be un un unhappy, unfortunate. The same way we, I, I, I give thanks to God. I don't see how I have not been settling quarrel between coordinator and coordinator. And I'm giving testimony. It's my testimony. That's my testimony. And that one is greater than the testimony I told you before this the scripture. That we don't have our coordinators here. They are fighting. And we say, coordinator A cannot look coordinator B in the face. Coordinator B and coordinator C. They have to go and see pastor to settle quarrel. It's a great testimony. And among our women, I don't hear sister so and so and sister so and so. They are not greeting one another. I believe it's not happening. And they say so and so, so and so, so and so. They are fighting. The brotherly kindness. Let's continue that same way. Let's look at some scriptures. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. I've seen that a lot among us, and I want to see more of it. In honor, you prefer me, I prefer you. I say, my brother, you have your own chance first. I say, my sister, you have your own chance first. And then I have my own after you. And that, when we are like that, and my other brother also says, no, my brother, you have your own chance first. And then we say, no, I will not agree. You have your own chance first. And we are like that in the body of what a beautiful family that will be. There's no competition. And there is no envy. And there is no jealousy. I just say, thank God, my brother, you go first. When you are gone, then if there is chance, I have my own way. They want to sleep on bed. I say, my brother, you sleep. I will sit down. No, he says, no, I cannot. How can I sit down? You sleep. I will sit down. He said, no, I will not agree. And then you are like, that's Christianity. And then you have this brotherly kindness of one another. We don't think hard thoughts about each other. We put the best construction on one another's behavior. John the Beloved, when he was about to die, the chief message he had, little children, love one another. And he said it in his epistle, chapter 1, chapter 2, up to chapter 5, we were told that that man became so old to a point that they, 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 they had to carry him to church. They, want, they, they would carry him to church. Even though he was so old like that, he couldn't walk again. He couldn't even stand up. They would, they would just carry him to church. And when he gets to church, they would say, everybody sit down, our... Our, our apostle, our leader, our father in the Lord, because he was father to many of those people in the church at his own time. He was the last apostle to die. They will say, our father wants to speak to us now. And then he, they will help him. They will, uh, you know, hold him, hold him there and stand him up. And then to preach his message. And what is his message? Little children love one another. And they will sit down. That's all the message for the day. My brothers and sisters, my message to you. Love one another. Where there is love, there will not be any evil work. Where there is love, there will not be anything evil. A brother offends brother in love. I meet my brother. I say, my brother, see what you did. And I was injured. Huh. 
See, my brother, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm sorry, please. What do I do to remedy it now? Oh, he says, I just, in fact, that I even told you it has even finished in my heart. In fact, if not because I wanted you to know about it, I wouldn't have told you, in fact. And then my, you hold one another. And then we, 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 nobody even knows anything has happened among us. But if it happens that the two brothers are fighting, coordinator knows about it, woman coordinator knows about it, the members of the church, they know about it. Everybody in corner corner, they know about it. All the newcomers that come to church, they know about it. That is no longer church. Let us be that we love one another. And you know, a brother and a sister, and Jesus said offenses will come. When we offend one another, how many times will my brother offend me? I forgive him till seven times. No, I didn't say seven times. I told you 70 times seven. And if your brother offends you seven times in a day, or 70 times in a day, and 70 times he comes to you and says, My brother, I'm sorry. Forgive him. That's the teaching of our master. If we are like that, love will flow among us. Remember that song? Let there be love shared among us. Let, when there is love, a lot of Satan will not have a place when there is love. Satan cannot catch anybody because we'll be our brother's keeper. We will not say which one is my own. I, I, I used to love before, but <laughs> they have taught me lesson. Now mm, I will know how to be very careful. I don't want anybody to say something about me. Hey, when we are like that, our first love has been love, and so let us love one another. First, taught to love one another. Love one another. That's the love of God. Hebrews 13:1. Let brotherly love continue let it continue we've had it over the years let it continue and as i i know it that there is brotherly love i see our love i see our togetherness i see our oneness of heart i see the, the, the nobody avoiding one another here i see that freedom i see the liberty when i finish monday meeting every monday i'll just sit down there and just walk and see the way you know we just walk and work together freely and hey, everything it's like we shouldn't go home and even when i was there i thought these people time was gone i thought really i said jesus name we pray amen everybody passes bible and they are rushing home, and they're still talking and they're still going together and it's just wonderful it's greater than any food any man can eat on earth. Let love continue. And then in 1 Peter 1 22, he tells us, See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. I give glory to God, I have testimony. I've not had a testimony that a coordinator said he loved a sister in the church or he loved a DLSO sister in the church and then they commit sin. I believe God has not allowed that. And I've not had that. Oh, well, we're sorry. This person was our coordinator, but he has grabbed one of the uh, women in the church and uh, well, they are falling. This is my story. This is my song. Praise him, my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praise him, my Savior all the day long. Pure heart, fervently. Our love should be pure, not polluted, perverted, immoral law. Let it be pure law and let it flow all the time. And then in 1 Peter 2 17, he also tells us about the love that we should have one to another. I'm quoting the passages because of time. Please, you can read them on your own later. In 1 Peter 2 17, he says, Honor all men, my brothers and sisters, let's honor one another. There is no little one among us. We are all important to God. Honor all men, please, please. Never do anything that will despise your fellow brother, your fellow sister, please. Let's respect one another. Let's love one another. My brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, there is a girl that comes to church here, in this mopa here, and she's a little bit, uh, you know, she's having little some problem. Many of you know her. When I meet that girl, that uh, uh, lady, I, I, I give her the honor, even though I know that some people feel that this one can you talk. I discuss with her. I ask her question, and I check up on her welfare, because... She is part of the body. Honor all men. And if they may be any non-entities, don't let us do anything that will disdain anybody. Even if they are not born again, they are created in the image of God. Honor all men. Then he says, love the brotherhood. Love the brethren. Let's love one another. Then he says, as you are loving the brethren, fear God. Don't let your love of brother or love of sister make you to sin against God. Fear God. Then he says, honor the king. That means the leader over the man. Honor him specially. Honor all men generally, but honor the king specially. Let us learn, brothers and sisters, how to give honor to whom honor is due. It's something you are, sometimes when, when I hear you talk, it's like you, you've given too much, too much, too much honor. You know, sometimes some of us will talk and say some things and it's just undeserved. Too much. But please, as we do that, whoever the Lord gives, whoever the Lord sends, 
give honor to the king. And among ourselves here, we have leaders, we have, you know, hierarchies. As the Lord has ordained it to be, it was in the early church, we have it also today. You have, you are a zone, a house leader, honor your zone leader, honor your women rare. She may not know everything, but honor her all the same. Let the women rare zone leader, honor your coordinator, men and women. And let those women coordinators, men coordinators, honor your group coordinator. And let the group coordinator honor the, uh, the, the pastor. And let's honor one another, because... That's the command of God. Honor the king. Whoever has leadership over you, that's the king. Honor him. And then, the yeah, fellowship will be sweet and wonderful. First Peter chapter 3 verse 8, he says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Love as brethren. Let's love one another as brethren. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know, that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Love one another. If we love one another, Satan will not be able to get access to any of us. We'll be closely knit together. We'll be joined together. Don't let me hear over the years to come and say, well, uh, <laughs> that place, they fight. They grudge. In fact, there are camps there now. This one has his own clique. That one has his own gang. That one has his own gang. And uh, our brethren, my beloved brethren, because of microphone and speaker, I will not mention you uh, what I will say. But my beloved brethren, you know, from what is it even from over there? I cannot but mention it. You know, don't as we are there and we are here, uh, those of us here too, let us love one another. God has said, us. look at all the crises, 97, 98, and then we had peace, 99, and then it came back, 2000. Look at all that and see the church and see God in the way God has saved us. Oh, and the devil didn't want that. I know all the struggles, I know the battles that were fought. The devil wanted to scatter everything, but God kept us together. My brothers and sisters, see you, you are here tonight. What a joy to my heart. I told the pastor some, some time ago, I said, sir, of all the crises, the thing that makes me joyful is that today, if I still want to see my brethren from both sides and I want to bring them together, I say, pastor, you know, we still come together. I say, you know, sometimes, pastor, we even have holy communion in the thick of that battle, in the thick of that crisis. We still have holy communion together. And I say, you know, this brother from this uh, the native of this uh, side will bring holy communion to my brother and brother, sister, that other side, and that one will not say, me to you, you are killing my people, you are killing, forget it. And then we just have the fellowship together. I said, pastor, that's the joy I have. And even if uh, we lost people physically, they didn't die, but they went to other regions, they went to other places and all that. The people that remain, oneness. Look at all of us here. The other time on the camp ground, the two of them didn't see me, but in my heart, my heart was just, I didn't know how to thank God. A brother from Ife here, another brother from you know, Modaike, the two of them, they just held their hand and oh, it, was, it was the greatest vision I've seen. And that's just recently. Oh, I said, God, even if one dies now, this is okay. Because I know the daggers that they are still drawing at one another in the world. I know the bullet they are still trying to, uh, I don't mean physical bullet, of wars and everything. They are still talking, throwing against one another over there. Thank God for Christ. And thank God for the word of God. Thank God for the spirit of God. And my brothers, love us brethren. Let it keep it up. And if the devil tempts you to not continue in love, resist the devil and he will flee from you. First John 4, 7. My brothers, he says, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love is of God. Now, I've dealt like that on brotherly kindness. Then he says, add to brotherly kindness, add charity. Now, if you do all these things, you will not backslide. That's what the Word of God says. It is an antidote against backsliding. Now, very quickly go to the last point. Solid ground for our abiding boldness. Solid ground for our abiding boldness. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, well, I've read verses 12 to 15, because of time. Let's go to verse 15, 16 now. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we had, when we were with him, in the holy mount 
we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here was Peter's farewell message that he gave these people. And in his farewell message, he expressed the concern of all true shepherds. The concern of every true shepherd is that his flock will endure after he has gone. In verse 15, Peter said, I wish, I endeavor, that after I have died, you will still be remembering these things. And my brothers and sisters, I am not dying. It's only that, you know, I will not minister here. Now, because of that, my prayer, my desire is that after I am gone, you will continue remembering all these things. Now, what is it that he wanted them to remember? That was the purpose why he repeated to them again the solid ground for their faith. The ground for their abiding boldness. He said in verse 16, he said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of the Lord, he said, you know, we are bold to tell you. We have an abiding boldness. That what we are telling you is not just a joke, not riddles and jokes. What we have told you is not just uh, fables of uh, tortoise and uh, you know, rabbits. What we have told you is eternal, immortal, infallible truth. He said, we were not following fables. When we told you about the power of God, the coming of Jesus Christ, we are not, not just telling stories, my brothers and sisters. Here is solid ground. All that we have told you these years, I have not told you fables, the word of God. If there was any story or illustration that you think, you ought to forget. Forget that story. Forget that illustration. But remember the word of God. Remember the Bible. If there was any, any story I ever told you that you felt that story was not worthy, forget it. But the word of God. Stand on the wall. That is the only thing that cannot change. The cunningly devised fables, let them be forgotten. But the word of God, let it stand. And so, Paul, uh, Peter said, what we are telling you is not just stories. They are not fables. Number one, we were first-hand witnesses. That's in verse 16. He said, we were eyewitnesses. <laughs> you know the way John put it? First John 1, 1. First John 1, 1. He said, that which we, from the beginning, which we have had, which we have seen with our own eyes, like this, and our hands have handled of the word of life. I said, what we are telling you is not just stories. We saw it. We had it. We handled it. You know, when you have that kind of conviction, you are bold. I was telling one of our uh, group coordinators this morning. I said, my brother, I said, you know, I pray to God. Any message I will preach, but I will say, please don't let Pastor Kumuyi hear. Please, don't let him hear. I said, may, I ne may God never allow me to ever preach such a message. You know, there are people who preach messages, they say, don't let them hear. Uh, they, don't, don't tell them. I'm not talking of some of the things like what I shared. I mean, messages of the Bible. Because they say, you know, if Pastor hears now, he doesn't understand this one. The pastor uh, is too, he stays too much with Bible. He doesn't read other things. He doesn't go here, go there, you know, get things from anywhere and just put it together, add a little Bible to it and make a message out of it. He said, don't let him hear. I have never, everything I've preached, let him hear. Let him hear. If anything, let him hear. You can hear. By the grace of God, till now, there is nothing I've said that you cannot hear. You can hear it. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. We are telling you things. He said, we were first-hand witnesses. Proverbs 14, 5. A faithful witness will not lie. If you are a faithful witness, you will not lie. You will speak the truth. You will say it anywhere. Say it, let them know. First-hand witnesses. Peter said, we saw it. My brothers and sisters, you are also, you can, you have a strong basis for abiding faith also. You also, you, you remember. You are eyewitnesses. You remember those great, great Mount of Transfiguration experiences? You remember Impetus 92? Those of you who are there, you remember those great, 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 great days, April 1 to 4, 1992? You remember? 
You remember those of you who were campus ministers' conference? I think 90, maybe 92 also, if I remember. You remember those great times? You remember those messages? Great messages. You know all those brethren that came? You remember the brother who preached on the so great salvation? You remember? How the Spirit of God came upon that message? Maybe you have forgotten. Let me remind you. And he was telling us about the production costs of salvation. That the value of any good, if you want to know how valuable a good is, you want to put a price on that good, you will look at the production costs, you look at the distribution costs, and then you arrive at how much it will cost. He said, the production cost for our salvation is so high, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, like we had in the service, he came down to us. The Son of God became a Son of Man, and he stood before Pilate, the one he created himself. And Pilate said, won't you talk to me? Don't you know how power to kill you, how to make you alive? And he was looking at him. And after he described that, then he talked about the distribution costs, and he spoke about Mary Slessor, who came to Nigeria, and they called her the Queen of Carnivals, and could not marry the cause of preaching the gospel. And he said, you remember how the, the Spirit of God descended upon that message when that brother was preaching? And people were crying all over the hall, in Petrus 92. And it was so strong and powerful. Oh, for those days all over again. Mount of Transfiguration. And when you go through that, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. You remember? The workers retreat 99, just close by here, before back to the old path. You remember? Restoring the lost glory. You remember? God's controversy with Ephraim. Remember those messages? You know that you met God. Now, we have not followed Connie. You are five witnesses. If anybody says the word of God is not true, you know the word of God is true. You know what God, what God has done in your life. And then you remember all those other retreats, uh, general retreat, uh, uh, you know, workers retreat, and even Monday meetings here. For those of you who have been regular attendants, and other meetings, remember? You are eye witnesses. Jesus told the disciples, he said, Blessed are your eyes for what they see, and your ears for what they hear. Now, Peter said, all those things that we have done, he said, we remember them. And now God says in Isaiah 43 verse 10, ye are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. But then not only that, in Second Peter chapter 1, Peter said, not only are we eyewitnesses, and so we can be bold, we have a solid ground for our abiding boldness, because number one, we were eyewitnesses. Then number two, because of the infallible, eternal word of God. In verse 19 it says, the reason we are bold to preach to you is because we have a more sure word of prophecy. That is even surer than our own testimony or witnesses. The word of God is more important than whatever I have told you. If I told you any testimony, if I told you any story, if I told you any illustration, if I gave you any rebuke, if I said anything that made you smile, anything that made you happy, anything that made you sad, anything that made you cry, anything that made you sober, whatever I said. The word of God is more than all that. So, you can forget all those things, but remember the word of God. A more sure word of prophecy. And you do well that you take it to it. It's a light that shineth in a dark place, and it will be shining in your heart in Jesus' name. I pray that darkness will not come upon your life, and I pray that darkness will not come upon this church, this region. That until the day dawn, the word of God will keep on shining, and the word of God will keep on, the day star will continue to arise in your heart. You know the emphasis and the general tenor of the messages and the life and illustrations. This word of God, and it says, because of that infallible word of God, we are witnesses, Acts chapter 12. 20. Well, sorry, I know time is gone, but Peter said, I have a short time. So he said, I will put remembrance. Please permit me. Acts chapter 20 and in verse 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know it. We've told you all the counsel of God. And then uh, uh, Peter was, uh, Paul was talking to the Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 5, he said, Remember you know that when I was with you, I told you these things. I've told you. I told you about sin. I told you that backsliding is real. I told you there's nothing like eternal security. I told you about holiness of life and heart. And, and you know, check out all the retreat messages. Check out. I took the holiness messages, sanctification. I decided to do that because I wanted to know that is important. Maybe there may be once or twice that I didn't take. But check off from 1990. All those messages, the holiness messages, I will assign that to myself. 
so that I can re-emphasize it again at the retreat. And then even check all the Sunday messages, check the various things. You will see there a more sure word of prophecy. Take it to it. He said, daylight is like light that shines in darkness. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. Here the, the same Peter is said, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. My brothers and sisters, I have finished for tonight, but as we round off, let me now go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, remember, we started from remembrance. That the reason we are going through this study is because of remembrance. To so remind you, remind you, remind you what you should not forget. And even if you leave Ife, uh, maybe later, for somewhere else, remember all the time. Don't forget, because eternity hangs upon it. Eternity hangs upon it. Eternity hangs upon it. Look up at me here. Many of you, God has blessed you. He has prospered you. But He has just started. Great things will still come. When you become, in your profession, very highly placed, remember the Word of God. If you are promoted and you become far higher, maybe a commissioner, maybe anything, Maybe a director of the, the ministry of whatever. Or you become a professor, vice chancellor, those of you in the university system. Remember the word of God. If God promotes you and you have the privilege of becoming a popular acclaim after I'm, I've left here. And you, you are known everywhere and God just lifts you up. Uh, you become a chancellor or dean or whatever. Anything you become. Remember the word of God. Those of you who are young and you are still going to university and you are students studying now. And eventually, when you finish and you become university graduate, and then you get work in one bank and they are paying you in one month one hundred thousand naira. There are banks like that. And one month, one salary is one hundred thousand. By the end of the year, your salary. I know people like that. Million, three point five million salary package for one year. When that has happened, remember the word of God. It is easy to obey and remember the word of God when you are still low. When you get high, and you will get high. You become high. God lifts you. And you are known everywhere. You are marvelously helped. Please, remember the word of God. All that we have told you, they are not cunningly devised fables. And you too, wherever you get to in life, stand true. You may build house. Mansion, real mansion, and you have the opportunity to buy anything. Remember, all we told you about those things of the world. Remember the word of God. Remember moderation, humility, that you must see carry your cross and follow Christ day by day. Whatever you forget, remember the word of God. Hebrews 13, 7, as we pray, remember there. Which are the rule over you? Who have spoken unto you the word of God? Whose faith follow? Considering the end of their conversation. Remember those who have given you the word of God. Remember them and remember their faith. And consider the end, the end result of their lifestyle. Remember it. If you do, you will not backslide. If Jesus tarries, 10 years, 20 years, if Jesus has not come, we will still be together in this church. Carrying out the banner of the Lord so high. And uh, we lay our sword. You know that song, he says, it pays to serve Jesus. I speak from my heart. It will always be with us if we do our part. There is not in this wild world can pleasure and fault. There is peace and contentment in serving the Lord. I'll, 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 I'll be a true soldier. I'll serve him more than ever before. I love him far better than I did before. I'll do whatever he beats me, whatever the cause. I will be a true soldier. What did he say I will do eventually? I will die at my post. That's my consecration. Die at your post. If your post is singing in a choir, die at your post. If your post is an usher, die at your post. If your post is taking care of children, die at your post. If your post is taking care of youth, die at your post. If you're supposed, whatever, interpreting, or praying, or singing, or preaching, or working, whatever your post, you die at your post. And if you hear that I die, I die at my post. Let's rise up and pray.
In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for this solemn assembly. We thank you for the sober truths that have been exposed to us by your servant and by your minister who has labored tirelessly in our midst over these years. He has labored over us like a dying man to a dying world. He has not spared his life, even in the midst of danger, in times of peril. Lord, he has taken his life in his hand, in order to minister the word of truth to us, so we can thereby be saved, and so we can thereby be preserved unto eternal life. And at this special time, He has called us to remembrance of all he has taught, of all he has preached, of all he has stood upon, of all he has warned us about, of all he has taken his time and life to build in us. He has reminded us he has told us again time and again that the greatest problem of humanity is the tendency to remember, I mean to forget the things they ought to remember. And therefore he has spent time again to remind us everything from here to sex. Oh Lord, we are not ignorant of all these things. We knew them, he told us, that here is this problem that we all have that is very close to us, the tendency to forget. He has shown us in the life of Peter, how though he knew all these things, he forgot them, and that forgetfulness nearly caused him eternal separation from the Almighty God, who is sufficient unto all these things, Lord. We all are men of like, uh, of same persons. We have this weakness in our nature. Oh Lord, but he has reminded us again so that we will not forget. Father, we are praying unto you this evening. Help us not to forget any of these things in Jesus' name. He has told us. And that is the truth, Lord. Eternity depends on the remembrance of all these things, and the continuance of these things steadfastly to the end. Father, if there's any prayer point, <laughs> if there's any heart cry, <laughs> if there's any request, if there's any plea, <laughs> oh Lord, we ask you, we help us to remember, oh Lord, <laughs> in the daytime, <laughs> in the noon, <laughs> in the night, <laughs> when we are asleep, oh Lord, let our spirit be awake. And let us not forget any of these things in Jesus' name. Father, He has shown us how we ought to live. He has told us if we should not pass light, then these seven things are imperative in our lives. The faith, the foundation of everything. Oh Lord, we look up to you. Help us. We are weak, but thou art strong, Lord. Help us. Help us. Help us. Oh, Lord, we are weak. You are strong. You are the only one that can help us through. Oh, Lord, help us. Not to depart from the faith in Jesus' name. Some have boasted before. They said if other people backslide, they will not backslide. They say other people may be do anything, they will hold on to this thing. But not long after that, they soon, de they soon deny the law. Oh, oh. oh Lord, we call upon you, hold our hands. Hold our hands so we will not fall. Hold our hands, oh Lord. We don't want to fall. <laughs> we don't
don't want to backslide, don't want to depart from the faith. Oh Lord, we look up to you, Father. Help us, help us, help us. Keep us by your power to the end, in Jesus' name. It was in the wish of Demas. Peter least expected this, <laughs> that he can disappoint Christ. That he can, he can say he never knew Christ. Oh Lord, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us. Hold our hands, Lord. You pray for Peter and your prayer work in his life. You are still on the throne. You are interceding for us. Let your intercession uphold every one of us steadfastly in the faith. In Jesus' name. Father, apart from the faith, you have told us about knowledge, how we need to build up knowledge. You have told us about charity. You have told us about brotherly kindness. You have told us about temperance. You have told us about many, many other things. All these seven pillars of our Christian faith. Mighty God of heaven, I pray that, Lord, you will look to it, Father. You will see to it, Father, that not a single one of them we crumble under us in Jesus' name. We are standing on these seven pillars. They are the things that, is, that are keeping us, that are holding us up. And you have told us, if we will not backslide, these seven things, they are imperative. They are indispensable. They are essential things. Mighty God of heaven, we look up to you today. Father, O oh Lord, see to you every day, every moment. That all these things are standing in our lives in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we look up to you. Father, help us, help us, help us, help us. Your grace made Peter who he was. Your faith, your grace made the, John the beloved, that aged apostle. That we are told, who always be carried into the church. At ah, this whole day, so head and leg, could not even walk again. He had to, he had to lay on work, on work his teeth, you know, to walk. And Father, until the end. Though he faced temptation, he faced peril, it wasn't easy at his own time, but he had done tenaciously to the end. Lord, your grace made him who he was. Your grace can make us who we ought to be. And your grace can see us through. Father, we hang upon your grace this evening. Uphold every one of us by your grace in Jesus' name. Taste this faith, this precious faith. Lord, we have enjoyed it together. We have rejoiced. We have passed in it together. Lord, it has been so precious. It has helped us this far in our journey. Oh Lord, we hold on to you, Father. We hang on you, Father. We look up to you, oh Lord. Mighty God of heaven, I pray. Uphold us on the end in Jesus' name.